And that concludes this item of business. Members, I have received notice from the Minister of Health that he wishes to make a statement. I call on the Minister. Mr Speaker, um, can I thank you for allowing me to make this urgent oral statement and I apologise to, to members for the late notice on the delivery of the statement because I wanted to make sure that it was most, the most up-to-date advice we have. Mr Speaker, further to my oral statement on Monday the 2nd of March on COVID-19, I wish to give members a further update on recent local developments. Firstly, I can confirm that as of 9am today, the 9th of March, 222 tests have been completed in Northern Ireland. While the vast majority have been negative, we now have 12 positive cases in Northern Ireland. I can update the House and the general public regarding the five presumptive positive cases announced yesterday evening. The Public Health Agency advises that two of these cases were travel-related, involving individuals who had recently been in Northern Italy. The remaining three cases can be traced to previously reported cases that involved recent travel to Northern Italy. One of the three is a young person. The individual attends a school which is co-located with a primary school. Both schools have recently been advised by public health and from the public health protection consultants. PHA is content that there is no public health risk to anyone attending either of the schools. However, it understands a precautionary measure both schools will be closing today to undertake an enhanced clean. I would also like to reassure the House that contact tracing for all five cases is at an advanced stage. All individuals who have tested positive are receiving appropriate specialist health care in keeping with expert advice and agreed procedures. The Public Health Agency have put in place robust infection control measures to help prevent further spread, while contract tracing of those who have come into close contact with the individuals has been undertaken immediately. Those requiring appropriate advice will be provided with it. In addition, in light of the increase in numbers of cases and in wanting to keep the House and members of the public fully informed of what is clearly an involving situation, I can advise that the Department will be moving to daily reporting of cases, as currently happens in England. The intention will be to release the figures each afternoon. As I have outlined previously, the increase in positive cases is not unexpected, and I would advise members of the public not to be unduly alarmed by these developments. I cannot discuss individual cases, but I am fully aware of the press reporting linking one of the cases to some football teams. And I can assure members and everyone listening that all appropriate actions are being taken in relation to all the confirmed cases. The overall risks to individuals in Northern Ireland has not changed at this stage, and that's based on the advice of the UK Chief Medical Officers. The risk to the UK still remains at moderate, but this will be kept in review. I would echo the calls of the Prime Minister and advise people against panic buying of foods or other products at supermarkets. We remain focused on the containment phase at this point, which is aimed at preventing the disease from taking hold in the United Kingdom. We have been clear that we will communicate any move to the delay phase, but I would remind members that this will not be a sharp transition and we will continue with many of the current actions in the containment phase. The First Minister Deputy First Minister and I have been in discussion with our counterparts across the UK at a Cobra ministerial meeting this morning to consider the scientific evidence which will guide us in our steps to flattening the peak of the outbreak in the UK, to delay and spread the impact on our health service, to push the peak away from this time of year and to protect those most at risk. Members will also be aware of the rise in cases in the Republic of Ireland, which currently stands at 21. This includes two cases of community transmission. Urgent contact tracing for the latest case is now underway. There are no known implications for Northern Ireland at this stage, and the relevant public health bodies remain in close contact. Whilst the situation is serious, I would like to reassure members that detailed plans are in place in the event of an outbreak spreading across the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland with sustained community transmission. Our health service is used to managing infections, and we are well prepared to deal with this. I again would like to reassure members of the public that we are taking all necessary measures 
to minimise the risk to them. We are, to, to, we are continuing to plan and we will be ready for all eventualities. Extensive work has been undertaken to ensure that all trusts have COVID-19 pods in place, which will enable patients suspected of having COVID-19 to be assessed and treated away from the routine hospital work. We continue to review the best use of testing and current clinical pathways so that individuals receive the appropriate care, recognise that many patients will have a mild illness. My department has established a new directorate, which is dedicated to surge planning. At operational level, a regional surge planning subgroup has been established by the Public Health Agency and the Health and Social Care Board to ensure that there is an appropriate and proportionate level of health and social care preparedness across the sector in response to COVID-19. Twice weekly meetings are held and a COVID-19 surge planning workshop was held on the 5th of March. The purpose of the workshop was to consider trust surge plans and self-assessment checklists in order to share actions and ensure regional consistency where possible. Across the Northern Ireland Civil Service, planning has been stepped up to ensure a coordinated response from all sectors of government. The Executive Office, Office is leading the work on assessing essential services and key sectors' readiness and have convened weekly C3 meetings. C3 means command, control and coordination. The Executive Office led a workshop on the 6th of March to discuss departmental risks and priorities. I remain in close contact with the other UK health ministers as well as executive colleagues on all recent developments at the executive meeting. Twice weekly COBRA ministerial meetings are now planned to ensure that our joined up approach to tackling this disease continues. This will be more frequent as required. My department will continue to work closely with the relevant departments across the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland to ensure Northern Ireland is well prepared to deal with the situations as events unfold. While the Health and Social Care Board will continue to liaise with their counterparts and the Health Service Executive in the Republic of Ireland to ensure that, where possible, both jurisdictions can make the best use of our collective resources when responding to COVID-19. As the situation develops, my department and the Public Health Agency will continue to provide updated guidance to healthcare professionals and other departments and their authorities, including schools, as and when necessary. There were differences on travel advice to Italy provided by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and the Department of Foreign Affairs in the Republic of Ireland. Following discussion with the First and Deputy First Minister and their representation to the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, and in light of decisions taken by the authorities in Italy, I am advised this variation has now been addressed. Mr Speaker, my advice to the public remains the same. To those members of the public who have symptoms and are concerned they may have COVID-19, I would urge them not to turn up at GP clinics or hospital emergency departments. They should instead contact their GP or GP out of hours. They will get advice in the next steps, including testing if required. Northern Ireland now has full access to the 111 COVID-19 helpline, which is available 24-7 to provide advice. More general advice about COVID-19 is available at the Public Health Agency website and the NI Direct. For those who are advised to self-isolate at home, they have a responsibility to follow that advice. We all have a responsibility to take steps to protect each other. In the time ahead, we will also need to consider how best to protect those at most risk. In all of this, we will be guided by the evidence of what is most effective. I would like to remind members and the public that good personal hygiene is key to helping stop the spread of flu and similar infectious viruses. As such, everyone can help to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and other viruses by ensuring we all take sensible precautions, precautions such as washing our hands thoroughly and often and to heed the standard advice recommended for similar illnesses such as cold and flu by ensuring that when we sneeze, we catch it, bin it and kill it. My department, including the health and social care system, have planned extensively over the years for an event like this and therefore is well prepared to respond in a way that offers substantial protection to the public. As members will be aware, the UK-wide Coronavirus Action Plan, published on the 3rd of March, sets out what the UK as a whole has already done and plans to do to tackle the current coronavirus outbreak. Internationally and in the UK and the Republic of Ireland, 
we remain in containment phase of our response as we seek to prevent sustained community transmission. My priority as Minister is to ensure that all effective measures continue to be put in place in Northern Ireland. In conclusion, it is vital that we keep taking a balanced, proportionate approach at all times, with our actions based on best scientific advice. Our primary focus remains on containment at this time and then to delay and mitigate. Mr Speaker, in concluding, let me underline some key points that should offer a level of reassurance. We need to walk a fine line and be alert but not alarmed. The current evidence is that the vast majority of cases appear to be mild and make a speedy recovery. That is a crucial point that we have to keep reminding people of at every opportunity. Yes, some of our citizens are more vulnerable than others, and we have to work hard to ensure they get the protection and support they need, not just from the health service, but from across society. We are working intensively with the public health colleagues in Great Britain and the Republic of Ireland to do all we can conceivably can to protect our citizens. The challenges, problems and dilemmas we are grappling with are mirrored right across these islands. Decisions will be based on the most up-to-date scientific and medical advice. As at times like these, we really see the value of our National Health Service. As been preparing for a pandemic, we have some of the top experts in the world advising us on what to do. We have staff across the system working night and day on this, and no one who falls sick is going to have to worry about how much treatment is going to cost. I also have to be frank with people. This is not going to get any easier any time soon. The indications are that it is likely to get much worse and more challenging before we are through the worst of this situation. We can expect significant ongoing increases in the numbers of people testing positive for COVID-19 in Northern Ireland, but the same will be said in England, Scotland, Wales and the Republic of Ireland. Mr Speaker, health systems across the globe are coming under pressure and increasing pressure at the vi- as this virus spreads. Ours will be no different. This is bound to take its toll. Normal business and health and social care may not be possible. Some activities may unfortunately have to be scaled back, but such decisions would not be lightly taken. But let's not sit back passively and wait for the worst to happen. As I have said, guided by the evidence, we will act to delay and push the peak to lessen the pressures on our health service. Mr Speaker, we can all make a difference. Washing our hands properly is not a well-meaning or trivial piece of advice. It can really help us slow the spread of COVID-19, help us even out as as, as much as possible the impact on our health service, push us into a period where flu and other winter illnesses aren't around to add to our burdens. That's why containment is so important and won't have been a failure if or when we move into the delay phase. So let's recognise and appreciate the work our public health agency has been doing. Let's understand the vital importance of self-isolation and contact tracing that has been done so far. Without that work, our total today would be much higher. Let me assure members that we are in no way being passive or defeatist. It is by no means inevitable that the surge in positive cases in other parts of the world will be replicated here. But we all need to rise to the challenge. That includes every single one of us following the simple advice on washing our hands. This is not an optional add-on. We owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our families to keep doing the right things. And Mr Speaker, we owe it to the sick, the elderly and the vulnerable in our society because we cannot let them down. Thank you. And I call the chairperson of the Health Committee, Colm Gilderney. Uh, <clears throat> I want to thank the Minister for the urgent briefing that he has given to the Assembly today on an issue which is very fluid and indeed at times fast moving. I also would like to endorse his uh, recognition of the work that is being done by the PHA and by medical clinicians uh, in relation to this, and also uh, frontline health staff and the work that they are doing and will be doing in, in the time ahead. 
A concern I share with many people is that the response of the North Public Services must be given the flexibility to respond to the unique circumstances we have here on the island. Uh, and that is circumstances which are both of benefit in some ways, but also additional challenges that we will have. So can the Minister outline what consideration he has given to how services may move from containment to delay and mitigation, including if this will be done in consultation with the Southern Health Care Authorities? As, I've, no, as I said in my statement, and I thank the Chair of the Committee for his support for the work of the professionals in the, the health and social care system while we get ready for what will be the next move. We are currently in containment phase because it's working for us here in Northern Ireland. But there is no doubt that at some point we will have to move to the delay sequence. That will be replicated and advised by, by the science that we receive at a COBRA level and across the United Kingdom. I am in, in nearly daily contact with Simon Harris, the Health Minister from the Republic of Ireland, and it's something where our interactions with each other is guided by what we're both doing. Now, we are in different jurisdictions. We will take different approaches at different times, but we can be assured that the coordination between ourselves in the United Kingdom and ourselves in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland is something that I take very serious and is working to date. Um, soon we will have actually have a five-party, or sorry, or five chief medical officers from across the, the jurisdictions will be, will be having a, a conference call to see and make sure we have that consistent approach as well. Our public health agency and the HSE in the south have already been working hand in hand when it comes to contact tracing as well. So there is a coordinated response that we're taking across these islands that I think will help us in how we tackle COVID-19. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank for his statement. And is very, on this very important and challenging issue, and for all your efforts to date. You certainly have been in the deep end since you went into that post. Like many uh, MLAs, I have been contacted by a number of constituents and business owners who are very concerned about this ever-increasing situation. Has the Department uh, have had any discussions with our local airports and ports regarding travellers coming into Northern Ireland, particularly from hotspot countries? such as Northern Italy and other highly affected areas, and what has been done to reduce the risk there from those people coming in to Northern Ireland? Yeah, and, and I thank the member for his question, and it's well made because we do have people coming into to Northern Ireland all the time. We're fortunate that we never had those direct flights from some of the serious areas that were actually, I suppose, high on the agenda at the start. The guidance that is given to our ports and airports is centrally coordinated through Westminster as well, so that we have the central advice that goes to all ports and airports across the United Kingdom. But we also have produced, and the Public Health Agency has produced a number of information posters that you'll have seen if you come through the city airport or the international airport, guiding uh, arriving travellers as to what they should do and the actions they should take. But those, that advice and guidance is no different from the advice that you or I have. If you think you have the symptoms or are developing the symptoms of COVID-19, call the GP, call the GP out of ours and see if testing or what further steps is necessary. Don't attend the ED, don't attend the GP, but take that appropriate advice. I call Justin McNulty. Guru Mayagots, Kim Carla. Uh, I'd like to thank the Minister for his statement and for his efforts to date in trying to stem the, the, the spreading of the coronavirus. Um, I also want to pay tribute to our overburdened and undervalued healthcare workers who are going to be placed under nor enormous pressure in the coming days and weeks, and I want to wish them well in that challenge. We have heard today the St Patrick's Day Parade has been cancelled in Dublin and in Cork, and there are sporting events being played behind closed doors. What actions does the Minister envisage being necessary here in relation to St Patrick's Day parades, in relation to sporting events in the days and weeks ahead? Okay, I, I think, um, thank the member for his comment, but one I do want to address, our health service is not undervalued. It's definitely not undervalued by me as Minister because I realise what it's doing throughout the year, 365 COVID-19, irrespective of anything else. So our health service is widely valued and I think valued by everybody else in this House. In regards to the cancellation of, of large sporting events or public gatherings, at this minute in time I will be led by the science. The Specialist Advisory Group on Emergencies, which is a UK level of uh, committee of experts, 
At this minute in time, is advising us and across the United Kingdom that cancelling any large events or sporting activities would not have a serious impact on either delaying or containing the spread of COVID-19 at this minute in time. So I have no intention of, I suppose, giving out advice to either my, my ministerial colleague in the Department of Communities or sporting coordinators or organisations that they should be looking to cancel events. I'm aware of, of the I'm aware of the steps that, that have been taken in Dublin and Cork. I would also say to the member that the Republic of Ireland has seen um, community transfer of COVID-19. At this minute in time in Northern Ireland, we have it, haven't. So there is a, a reassurance in us. We're not at possibly the same stage that the Republic of Ireland is. But we will be guided by the science when it comes to taking decisions like that. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his uh, leadership so far with regard to COVID-19 and the coronavirus. Uh, I'd also like to put on record my thanks to the PHA and the, the Chief Medical Officer in particular, who I know is burning midnight oil, and with the rest of the members here, the emergency staff, and indeed those other emergency services who may well be called in, on, in the near future. And I also just want to be on record as thanking the Minister for the line that he's taken in terms of the nature of his response, because having worked for 20 years in emergency services and understanding how, the, how it is so vital to keep a cool head when given that leadership in instances like this, that that is the appropriate response, Minister. But does the Minister agree with me that it is essential that people who have the virus or fear that they may have it are not hit in the pocket for doing the right thing? that by staying at home, they would not only be helping themselves, but be helping us all by preventing the spread of the virus. Um, I fully agree with, with the member, and I think what he's talking about is that self-isolation that we're talking about. And I think it was actually raised when I made the statement last week, I think it was um, Jerry Carl actually raised it in regards to ensuring that people aren't hit from the initial point of view. That issue has been raised, I think, in the, in the House of Commons, if not by, by the Prime Minister, who has made that statement that the Department of Work and Pensions will put something in place to ensure um, that people aren't adversely financially affected by actually following what is good and, and science-based medical advice. Uh, the Department of Work and Pensions, I, I am aware, or should be in contact with the Department for Communities as to how that social welfare change needs to be made, because it is a devolved issue here in Northern Ireland. But if that's the guidance that's coming out of the UK and Westminster, it's certainly something that I would encourage our executive and ministers here to replicate. I call Paula Bradshaw. Mr. Speaker, thank you, Minister, for your work with relation to this. Um, your departmental officials and right across the health and social care sector. Um, before I ask my question, I would, I would just like to, to raise a slight concern. The, the education minister was speaking before us for you there a minute ago, and he said that legislation may be required um, to exclude children from places of assembly to prevent the spread of infectious disease. On the 27th of February, the Health Committee amended the Public Health Northern Ireland Act 1967 to bring forward those powers. So I would ask the Minister to ensure that his executive colleagues are aware of that um, coronavirus and COVID-19 has been added to the list of notifiable diseases. My question directly to you, Minister, is that given the process of referral um, to the drive-through testing um, facility in Antrim has been working well. Can you outline your plans to extend this provision to other trust areas? Thank you. I'm not exactly sure what your, your first comment is based on, but I'll, 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 speak to, I'll speak to my ministerial colleague in education because I do provide, I provide weekly updates to all executive ministers or if anybody needs any additional, they've been in contact with Chief Med Medical Officer and the Public Health Agency. Um, the testing pod that we have, have in place at Antrim Hospital has been replicated and has been re replicated across the number of our major hospitals. Unfortunately, we'll not be putting them at every hospital because of the speciality and the number of staff that we would actually be exposing by putting them in every location. Um, but what I would say and use this opportunity to say to members of the general public, just don't turn up at them. It's not for a bit of fun to go and see if you've got COVID-19. Actually, only go when you've been referred by, by a GP, because unfortunately we have seen some, member, or some members of the public actually turning up at Antrim just to get tested to see if, if they may have it or may not have it. It's by a GP <coughs> referral system. So I thank the member for drawing this to attention, and we're, we're putting those pods in place across as many hospitals as possible. I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I too would like to thank the Minister for his statement and pay tribute 
to his department and the many health workers that are dealing with this issue, and we know they're doing so in already very difficult circumstances given uh, the pressures that are on our emergency services and indeed uh, our emergency departments. Minister, uh, I, I want to uh, congratulate you in the terms and way you have presented this today in terms of clear, calm and consistent advice. I think that's essential. That's essential not only from politicians but indeed our health professionals. Given that one of the confirmed cases that you talk about affects my own constituency, you, you made reference to it in part, and while not talking about the specifics of the case itself, I have been feeling a lot of calls from businesses and indeed sports clubs uh, that have put on, on record not the confusion that with the Public Health Authority and, and indeed 111 helpline that some are receiving different advice to others. Now, while I don't know the individual case, uh, they do find this concerning given that they both maybe have had contact with the individual or individuals, uh, but one is saying to self-isolate and the other one is saying to not. So I wonder if you could maybe give some clarity on that or maybe follow that up in, in terms with the Public Health Authority. Thanks. I call Emma Rogan. Thank you. More than happy to take them in groups of three if you want, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> They're much easier answered that way. Um, no, what I would say to the member, I, I would be surprised if there's differing advice coming out of the Public Health Agency and the NHS 111 because they are working from the same the same script and the same scientific advice. So I'll take it on board, I'll raise it with both, but I would be very, very surprised because what I have found, and I've said this last week as well, since, since coronavirus first raised its head here in, in, in Northern Ireland from across the world, the level of professionalism in our health service is second to none at all levels. And I will be surprised, but I'll, I'll take the member's point on board. Emma Rogan. Um, I would like to thank the Minister um, for this urgent briefing to the Assembly today. In particular, it can be very challenging for our frontline health care staff working tirelessly to continue to deliver the services. Um, can the Minister detail what discussions he has had to date with health care um, trade unions um, on the, the, the ever-moving situation that is happening at the minute? <laughs> What, what I would say, and it's one of those things, the work that has gone on behind the scenes for us preparing and keeping up to date with the ever-evolving situation that is COVID-19 and coronavirus. My chief medical officer is in contact regularly with the trust, with the trade unions. We'll be moving out now to contact actually faith-based groups, fundraising and community groups, uh, to make sure we have a holistic, to make sure we have a holistic approach as to how we actually respond to this. Our health unions are a crucial part of our workforce, as is every section of our workforce. And they're, they're, they are valued and they're a part that, that I've engaged with often and will continue to engage with, because without them working with us, this system does not work. Call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you very much to the Minister for his very detailed and excellent uh, statement there, which is very informative. But uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus, is with us now uh, in 319 cases across the UK, tw uh, 12 in Northern Ireland. The government is still in containment, but the virus is expected to spread. Uh, you alluded to a young footballer who, who was tested positive at the weekend, but he didn't know until after the game was over, and both clubs have cooperated uh, fully to try and, and contain that. But what plans are in place for large gatherings like churches, uh, sporting events, and uh, community halls. I'm a believer, I'm not being alarmist in any way, uh, Minister, but I'm a believer in, in planning and pre-planning and pre-discussions on what may happen when the time comes is better than saying we need to do this. Can I ask the Minister, has he, has he already prepared that? Thank you. And I will point out to the Member, as I said earlier, I'm not going to comment on any, any specific case. But in regards to planning, it's something I can assure him. We've been planning. The, the health service has been planning for situations like this, and they do it. They do it year in, year out. For this specific one, the work that has been put in in, in the last 68 weeks is second to none. 
there's no, I don't think there's an, an eventuality that should take us by surprise. In regards to the large-scale events, it's something that was discussed this morning, not just here in Northern Ireland as, as preparation for planning, but also at a COBRA level meeting. So we're discussing how we, had, we approach large-scale gatherings at a UK level so that they'll be consistent, so that the message will be consistent across the United Kingdom, so there's not a differential in message that confuses, confuses our people when they see something different happening in England, Scotland or Wales. So the level of planning, the members should be reassured, is something that I hope we never have to use some of the detail that we've prepared for, but it is impressive for the work that's being done, and I can assure them the work is being done. Bradley. Mr Speaker, um, I too would like to thank the Minister and all those who are charged with um, trying to realise containment on this issue. Could I ask the Minister what safeguarding or protection for the supply of and the health of domiciliary care workers is taking place within the Department? As he rightly pointed out, you know, we owe it to the sick, the elderly and the vulnerable in society. And these workers are very often the lifeline to those people. And I would like to know what protections are in place for them. I think the member has touched on that, that critical point of our health services, how we support our domiciliary care workers who will be supporting the most vulnerable in our society when we go or if we have to go to that further stage where we talk about self-isolation or further containment as well, where, where often those people will be the ones who will be asked to stay in their home and self-isolate. So the, the support that we give to the domiciliary care worker is as important as any other frontline health professional that we have in the system. Now, the, the, the surety that may come by some methods of protective clothing may not be as scientific-based as presidentially-based as people come to, may, may come to perceive. So the support that we give them will be in the same guidance that we give to other health, health and social care workers. Make sure you're washing your hands, make sure you're taking the appropriate precautions where you're going into people's homes, things that they should already have been doing, should they be going into a home that already has flu or any other virus infection that's in there at this moment in time. Our domiciliary care workers are, again, skilled professionals in what they do, sometimes very underrated professionals in what they do, but they're a very, very valued part of our health and social care system. I call Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I too am, like the Minister, am thankful that we have access to some of the experts in the world through the uh, UK's National Health Service, and we, we must be really appreciative of that and all those who are involved in, in planning and the preparation, and indeed those who are already on the front line uh, against the coronavirus. What advice does the Minister give to employers uh, in terms of their responsibility to their employees? to their employees' families and indeed the wider community if they are engaging in contractors and bearing in mind uh, many have been uh, identified as coming from the, the virus, it's been identified, it's been linked in many occasions to Northern Italy, employing contractors who emanate from Northern Italy or other hot spots so that uh, ultimately the community is not endangered from that. Do the same issues that apply to travellers apply to employees who may be coming uh, to Northern Ireland to work in essential equipment? Um, I, no, I almost think the member answered his, his, his own question there, that anyone coming into Northern Ireland should treat this virus the same. It, it, it will not be cognizant of whether you're, you've come from Italy, Iran, Port of Down or Port of Ferry. It will have the same, the same influence uh, and the same non-respect for for your health care system. So if there are, I suppose, individuals or subcontractors coming from somewhere else in the world, they should take the same advice that we're giving out from the Public Health Agency in regards. If you think you have the symptoms of coronavirus, you know, contact the GP, contact GP out of ours. And I think one of the things that should be strengthened and the message that should be put out there, because of the National Health Service in regards to uh, COVID-19 being a notifiable disease, and because of of the structure that we have in our National Health Service in Northern Ireland, they should not be charged for that advice or the support that may be necessary as well. In regards to a support for, for an employer, the employer has, a, I suppose, a duty of care as to looking after, after his employees, so it is up to them to make sure that all provisions are in place that support their, them in their workplace. Mr Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I thank the Minister for his statement so far? Um, in light of the panic buying that is going on with small amounts of the public, which is unfortunate and not required, 
Could the Minister give a reassurance to us that um, there will be enough hand uh, sanitizers for health staff, and especially those who are working in care in the community? Uh, and the member does make, make a very valid point, and I think we saw over the weekend in regards to the panic buying that was taking place, and where those who are doing it may think they are doing it for the right pur purposes. It also puts a financial burden on those who can't afford to bulk buy. So those people who are, are, I suppose, living week to week and what they do in their daily shop, should it be in regards to toilet roll, hand sanitizer, soaps, tins of beans, whatever it is, I think there's a duty and onus upon the members of the general public not to panic and not to look for that oversupply of something that they think may be giving them a reassurance, but is actually putting somebody else under further pressure. And I think that sort of message has been laid out by the retail consortium today as well. But in regards to the supplies of the health service, I can assure the member we are not looking to any of the large supermarkets to buy either hand sanitizer or soap. The National Health Service is supplied in, in the, the stocks of those products that it needs. I call Mark Durkin. I thank the Minister for his statement. I, I, I acknowledge the Minister says that Healthcare staff are not undervalued, and that is, is, is great. However, the minister can't deny that they are overstretched. We know we have a couple of thousand uh, nurses uh, at shortage. Is the minister confident that we do have enough capacity within our health workforce to deal with what could come? And is there contingency plans in place for when uh, healthcare staff inevitably have to take time off themselves? You know, and again, the member makes that valid point, and I'll refer him back to actually what I said in my statement. In normal business and health and social care may not be possible. Some activities may unfortunately have to be scaled back, but those are decisions that won't be taken lightly. So, and, and that's due the, around the support that we need to give to our staff as well, so they can provide the first class health care that they expect to give and we expect them to give as well. There all are, I suppose, plans in place, and, and it's something that has been looked at, although we haven't enacted, about how we bring back retired professionals into the health and social care service and in the health and social care sector, but also put them in a place that they don't become vulnerable or open to contagion, because you know, it's the older age group that, that may be particularly at risk. So it's where we can best place them, best utilise their skills. And look, we've already been contacted by the department, by GPs, nurses who want to step up because they've been part of that caring profession that we know, we recognise, and they know they're part of when they have a skill and they have a desire to give. It's something that if the point comes where we have to use them, we will utilise the skills that are there. I call George Robinson. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to thank the Minister for his very important statement. And could, I, could I ask the Health Minister if he can give an, an assurance that all hospital staff and other health staff who are treating and in contact with patients with the virus are all supplied with the appropriate clothing? He may have answered this before, but I will ask it again. And could I commend all health staff for the terrific work that they do for us all? Yeah, and I, I thank the member and every member I think in this House for their support for our health and social care stuff. But, because don't, and I would say this to all members, don't underestimate the value of our words of support and encouragement and here actually have on a workforce that is under pressure and is, and, and is feeling that pressure at this moment in time. In regards to the protective clothing for those who are coming into to face to face contact with those who are already uh, positive for COVID-19, they have all the appropriate protective clothing that they need, and that's something that we ensure as a health service that they do. Call Pat Catney. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Minister. I'm sure the whole House will agree that you carry a heavy weight here on your shoulders, and uh, we would like to be able to give you whatever support or possible from here, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm thinking of the homeless and cross-cutting with the Minister that was here earlier with their communities. But I wanted to ask the Ministry, I was wondering, has the Minister been able to consider the report from the HSE that said the number of people that potentially become infected with the COVID-19 could be conservatively put at 1.9 million following an outbreak? And does he believe that our health service will be adequately equipped? And I don't want to say that as a form of scaremongering. I'm saying that we plan for the worst and hope for the best. 
Okay, and again, I, th I think I think the member, and I think he's right. We do plan for the worst and hope for the best, and I think that's what we have been doing at this minute in time. I, I'm not aware of the member's report, but the figure does not sound right to me, because simply the population of Northern Ireland is 1.8 to 1.9 million. So the indication. Of All right, sorry, I, I, I haven't had sight of that, that that report. But look, we are looking. I, I suppose in, in the scientific in the scientific advice we're getting, look, we can't expect anything from 50 to 80 percent of the population being infected by COVID-19. Now, that's at different levels of infection, and that moves to very worst-case scenario as well. So the member can do the sums himself, 1.8 million at 0.8 is, is quite a bit. I'm not going to get into the middle mass exercises today again. I call to Liam McLaughlin. Sorry, I didn't ask um, to speak. Thank you. Go on, thank you. Uh, Claire Bailey. Thank you, speaker, and thank the Minister for the statement. It's, um, it's greatly appreciated, and I just want to put on record my respect and admiration from all healthcare workers um, who are taking on extra duties um, and must be commended, just given that we all know that they're working in extremely stressed out and under-resourced circumstances currently. But I'd um, be interested to hear from the Minister in terms of we are hearing reports that Dublin are going to cancel St Patrick's Day festivities, um, yet we're not having that um, announcement made here. Um, while that we are, well, it's good to hear that you're working well with your counterparts across the UK and in the Republic of Ireland. I want to maybe have a wee look at that disparity again. So if we're in a period of containment now, um, if we do have to move to um, a delay sequence, how is that calculated? Who makes that call? Is that going to be an island-wide response? Will that be a UK-wide response? Will that be a Northern Ireland response? And how are we going to join up the dots if we're talking about 50 to 80 percent of the population face being contaminated here? Thank you. Thank, um, and I thank the member for a point. Uh, the response will be science-based. We will take advice from uh, the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies, which is based in the United Kingdom. We'll take the advice from our Chief Medical Officer. Um, and as I said earlier in, in a response, the reason the member may be seeing a difference in our reaction to the St. Patrick's Day in Dublin and St. Patrick's Day here in Northern Ireland is the fact that we do not have any evidence of community transmission at this minute in time. So there is no scientific value of cancelling events at this moment in time. When we move to the delay phase, it may be necessary to cancel public events. But our concern is that if we move too early in taking that step, the public becomes used to it. They don't take the seriousness of it when we actually have to do it. So when I mentioned my statement about flattening out the curve, it's about the curve of infection in Northern Ireland. And that's about making the right call at the right time. Up until now, I've been guided by the science, and I'll remain to do that. That's the guidance I will take. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. Uh, the Minister says that the National Health Service is preparing for a pandemic. Um, of course, all of us hope that doesn't happen. But if it does, have we enough ventilators uh, uh, at our service in Northern Ireland for the most serious cases? And secondly, I don't want to at all trivialise this, but as an assembly, isn't it important that we set an example on these public health issues? Therefore, is it a good example that in this House we have open trays of unwrapped mints that members with hands washed or unwashed can handle as they help themselves? Or should we set an example uh, optimise the public health standards that we live to? Um, I, I'll take the member's first point. Uh, in regard to the ventilation and, and ventilators, ventilators that are there, um, discussed at, in, in other places is actually the purchase of additional ventilators should it be necessary. But it's not just about going out to buy ventilators, it's also making sure we have the trained staff to utilise them. And while we're still in containment phase, it's important that we stay in that phase as long as possible to make sure we don't get to a stage where that ventilation of, of large numbers of patients and individuals is actually necessary. In regards to, to your second question, 
And I know the member hasn't been facetious when he actually asks that question. I think it's, it's a valid point that maybe it's a valid point that maybe the House should look at. And I think it's one thing, and the point that he did make, if there is anyone to set an example to the, to the general public, it's us in this place, because this is where they're looking for, for their advice, guidance, and actually how to behave. And again, I'll go back to thanking all the members for the support that they've given um, our National Health Service, those people in working on it, but also the mature and responsible manner and how they're actually approaching COVID-19 coronavirus. And at this stage, we haven't got to the stage where people are trying to make political gain or right workings as to what is a very serious issue. Call Jerry Carl. Thanks, Mr Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for a statement. Um, does the Minister have any plans to ensure hand sanitizers are installed in all public buildings uh, and spaces to prevent person-to-person -person transmission? And will he look specifically at public buildings which are more likely to contain people with immunodeficiencies, such as PIP assessment centres like Capita buildings? It is an issue that has been actually has been raised earlier this morning, so it's not it's not well. It's a relatively new issue that has been, been brought to my attention, that it's something we could potentially look at. What I would say to the member, um, equally disappointing is the number of hand sanitizers that are now being stolen out of GP surgeries, hospitals and all the rest of it. So not only are we seeing the effect of panic buying, we're seeing people who are abusing what is a service and a provision that's put in for those people who are mostly at vulnerable, and that's the people who are in GP surgeries and the hospitals as well. So what I would say to, the, to those people who think they need that hand, hand sanitizer so bad that they're stealing out of our hospitals is actually catch yourself on because you're putting somebody's life at danger. But as in regard to, to supplying a, a, greater, a greater supply of hand sanitizers, hot water and soap is as effective. So if there's sinks in place in those agencies, they should be made, I think they should be made available to the general public so they can't be utilizing what are already provisions that are there. I call Daniel McCrossan. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for uh, your uh, address to the House uh, today. Uh, I also would like to put on record my sincere thanks and recognition of our hardworking health care staff here at the front line, and also their families who, in the context of what we're facing, are extremely worried uh, about their family members who are going under the front line to help those who are most in need. Minister, I've noted that uh, in your statement you have said that there is a a UK-wide approach in terms of an action plan to deal with this, but we are in one island and people transition across this island on a daily basis. You've mentioned that you're also in conversation with Minister Harris in the south of this island. Is there any plans for an all-Ireland uh, uh, action plan to, to tackle this? And also, uh, Minister, uh, in terms of Dublin Airport, uh, and, and other flights that are coming in and out to Northern Italy. Has there been any conversation with your department or yourself to stop those flights, given that there has been a significant number of people here who have contracted the virus and people who have been in Northern Italy? Um, and I think um, what, what we need to be careful of, and I know the member is not trying to make that's a political issue. I know he's looking at it from, from a wider sphere. Look, the interactions that we've been having with, with our, our counterparts in the Republic of Ireland at the Chief Medical Officer level, at the pub, Public Health Agency and the whole Health and Social Care Executive has been saying to none over the, these past few months in preparing as to how we react to this as people, not, not as politicians, not looking at, at political boundaries or borders, but how we actually respond to this to make sure that we provide the best health care and support to those who, who need it. In regards for me calling to cancel flights into Dublin, that's not within my remit. But I am aware that I think some of the airlines that have been flying in from Milan to Dublin have also con have actually cancelled their flights in, in the, recent, the recent weeks. Um, look, I, in regards to, to our cooperation on either side of the border, you know, I was in contact with Minister Harris after 10 o'clock last night. So the contact and the interactions that we have are, are, are done at all levels. Um, in regards to COBRA, you know, we work at a UK level in COBRA, but also the information that we have there is, is shared and utilised between our interactions with ourselves and the Republic of Ireland to make sure it's a consistent approach. And that's why I was able to say earlier on, because of the representations that have been made, that travel advice that's coming in regards to um, the ski trips and where, where people are going, because of representation that was made to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office has brought it in line with the Department of Foreign Affairs as well. So there is a consistent approach. We're not looking at this as, as political boundaries or as different countries. We're looking at how we address this as a people. Call Harry Harvey. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Minister. 
would you consider the possibility of testing those arriving in from highly infectious areas as a means of containment? Um, I, I, I think the members referring to temperature, taking people's temperature as they come in. The unfortunate thing that we have seen through COVID-19 and uh, in comparison to, I think it was SARS, um, COVID-19 actually can take up to seven to 10 days to develop, so you don't actually get a temperature there and then, whereas SARS, the temperature spike was immediate. So taking people's temperatures when they arrive in airports means you can actually miss people, so it's not an accurate way of pinpointing someone who has the virus as they get off a plane, unfortunately. Well, Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker, um, uh, and thank you for the minister, thank the minister for, his, for his statement and taking questions today. And again, like everyone else, I'll put on record um, gratitude and respect for um, health service workers who have been working extremely hard on this and will be putting themselves through even more in the weeks and months ahead. Um, just to follow up on a specific question about, in a sense, the All Island um, uh, complexion of this and respecting what the minister just said about how closely he's working with authorities in the Republic. Um, Given that in Dublin and Cork, St Patrick's Day festivities have been, been cancelled, there seems to be a clear public health emphasis being placed on um, members of the public not being, large numbers of people not being too proximate to one another, as in not being within a metre or two of one another. Does he have any, given he says it's now too early to, for example, start cancelling large scale sporting events or festivities in, in the north, what is his, would he give specific guidance to members of the public in terms of their proximity? Um, to other people at large-scale events, or, does he, or is, there, is there no new advice from, from his department? At this minute in time, there is no new advice in regards to large-scale events or public gatherings. Um, the scientific evidence and, and the advice that we're getting from SAGE, from the Chief Medical Officer, is that cancelling those events at this minute in time will not delay um, or help us in delaying the spread of, of COVID-19. There will become a point, or there may become a point, where that is necessary. If you use all the tools in the toolbox too early, they become ineffective. I call Orlea Flynn. Um, and I thank the Minister for the briefing on your answers thus far on what um, I know is a very fluid and complex situation. Um, some of the members had asked similar questions earlier, and I know some of the answers can be a wee bit, you know, there's a lot of overlap there. Um, but in relation to, you had already addressed around the issue around um, staffing and skills. Um, but my question is if the Minister could outline any additional capacity that has or that will be commissioned um, to address uh, the rise in demand in terms of assessment pads, um, bed space and ward space. Um, as I'm aware that in some of the other areas, particularly in the south of Ireland, they've commissioned um, some intensive care uh, beds. Uh, Gormiaga. And what the member, I think, refers to is the surge planning that we're currently undertaking across health trusts and the health and social care boards. So when we do see a ramping up of the number of cases, which we will see, you know, there's no point in trying to, to deny that. We will see that. So that work is already undergoing. It's been done by trust and the health and social care board as to how we will react at different levels and at different points as the number of cases actually increases. So it's how we utilise at that point. Um, members of the voluntary community sector, how we engage with faith-based groups, how we actually supply the support that people do need who are in the community and maybe, maybe need that bit of additional support because family members are elsewhere or tied up elsewhere um, or, or maybe self-isolating at that point in time. So all, all that work has, has been undone. We're looking at, at how we use different facilities and may have to reproportion different areas as well of different hospitals as to how we manage um, what is COVID-19? I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your statement and to those working at the front line of tackling COVID-19. Given the advice from professionals is to self-isolate if required, how would this work with those who live in hostels, in shelters or in refuges, say, for instance, who are victims who have left a violent domestic situation or are living in other shared accommodation or those indeed in our prisons? Would the Minister ensure that consideration is given to those who cannot self-isolate due to the nature of where they live, and should that be required, and ensure shared accommodation shelters and refuges are equipped to deal with this? And the Member makes, makes the valid point. You know, this, this is about how we look after the most vulnerable in our society. So if there is a, when advice and guidance has to be given for someone 
who finds themselves in one of those situations that they do have to self-isolate, the help and support should be there and should be, should be available to everybody in our society. It shouldn't be eligible for one and not for the other. So the member's point is well made and it's something I'll take on board. I call Linda Dillon. Carmel, good. Can Corley, could the Minister tell me, have you had any conversations with the Minister for Communities to discuss whether as was raised by, by Mr Carroll, people with immunodeficiencies who have to go to assessment centres should possibly not have to attend those assessment centres, either be assessed at home or assessments be delayed until obviously the, the scare around the coronavirus is, is over? It's not, it's not a conversation I've had, um, but I'm sure the member's ministerial colleague will be listening in and maybe we'll have the conversation. I'm happy enough to have it as to how we progress that to make sure those who most, mostly need that help and support in our society aren't put in situations or in areas where the risk of infection may be greater because of that need to attend an assessment. I call Catherine Kelly. Minister, what advice are health and social care workers being given on their return to work from affected areas like China and North Italy? I'm aware of one case where a health worker was returning from Northern Italy and was advised to return to work unless they were showing symptoms. As again, I, I can't comment on individual cases in regards of it coming back from, from Northern Italy. There's, there's the advice that should have been taken should have been that that come out from NHS 111 or the PHA. I'm not sure even of the date that the member's referring to, so it may have been a date that preceded that advice being given, but if the member has specific concerns that they want to share with me or the public health agency, it's something I'll take on outside this chamber. Okay. Dolores Kelly. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, Minister, thank you for your statement. And you've been very clear telling people to be sensible and not alarmist. Uh, you will be aware that the Chief Constable called for similar powers perhaps to be introduced here in relation to detaining people who are unwilling to go into quarantine, that that's being looked at by the Westminster Parliament. Uh, are you considering with the Public Health Agency to add COVID-19 as one of those uh, infectious diseases which would give the police additional powers uh, following medical assessment? I think um, actually Paula Bradshaw referred to it earlier on the health committee, and I think the chair can back me up on the date, the 27th of February. I actually made COVID-19 a notifiable disease. That order came into effect on the 29th of February, so that that supporting mechanism, as requested by my department, was supported by the health committee. And the additional powers is in place. Okay, members. That concludes questions on the statement. Mr. Andrew Muir has been given leave.